So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, another day, uh, another workshop uh, as part of the advanced scientific techniques to inform integrated coastal zone management series. Today we're going to talk about uh, again monitoring for ocean acidification, but we're going to focus on data. How do we get data? Why we get data? Um, how do we process it? Uh, and then what do we do with it? So again, this session is focused on um, collecting data using equipment that uh, the CME program has donated uh, to countries. So aspects of it may be irrelevant to uh, some of you that come from um, different countries or different organizations. So the first session, um, we're going to uh, talk about why we need ocean, ocean notification data. Some of it is gonna be uh, slightly redundant from previous talks, but bear with. Uh, then how we measure ocean acidification using the ocean acidification sensor kit. How do we download the data? How we process the data? What the data looks like? And then how do we interpret the data? And then the ultimate goal is to submit this data somewhere to make it useful, uh, to make it accessible to policymakers perhaps. So we'll discuss on uh, how we submit this data for uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 14.3. Then we can have an open discussion uh, about any uh, questions or any concerns anyone has. Following my talk, we'll have um, my colleague Sarah Cryer, who will um, show you some examples of what you can do with the data you collect. She'll present data collected in um, different uh, small island uh, developing nations um, using uh, the ocean acidification kits and will try and interpret what the data uh, shows. Just to give you an example of what you can do with the data. So ocean acidification, um, we uh, talked about ocean acidification quite a lot the last few days. Uh, what is ocean acidification? Uh, since uh, the Industrial Revolution, we've been releasing a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere through the combustion of fossil fuels. Now that CO2, a big part of that CO2, makes it into the ocean. So the ocean absorbs that CO2, which in one respect is good for us because it slows down the rate at which the atmosphere is warming up. But on the other hand, because the ocean is absorbing the CO2 is becoming more acidic. And we know that this is happening. Uh, this, is, this is a fact, this is not fake news. We've been measuring CO2 in the atmosphere for quite some time now, as you see here on the, on the figures. But we'll also be measuring ocean acidity for quite some time. And we see that CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, while at the same time, the pH uh, in different parts of the ocean is decreasing. Now, why do we care uh, about uh, the decrease in pH in the ocean? Well, when the pH changes in the ocean, when pH declines in the ocean, it changes the speciation of carbonate species or the carbon chemistry of the ocean. Now that creates a problem for organisms that use calcite or calcium carbonate to build their skeletons or their shells. Corals, for example, or mollusks or other uh, bivalves. They make their, their shells and their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. Now, if you, if you live in an increasingly uh, acidic environment, then it's becoming more and more difficult first to build your shells, but also at the same time, in some cases, uh, the water becomes so acidic that shells become to dissolve. 
And we've seen that uh, in um, environments where uh, low pH is, is natural. For example, in CO2 sips, um, where CO2 is released from uh, hydrothermal sources uh, from the earth, then we see a naturally low pH environment. And we can see there that uh, organisms like corals or other calcifiers are struggling to uh, survive. And this is, these pictures are an example from um, Australia, from the recent Australia. And of course, this is a global problem uh, and a problem with severe consequences on uh, the marine uh, ecosystem, but also the marine economy, the livelihood of uh, a lot of people, uh, the blue economy in general. And uh, the United Nations uh, do recognize this, and therefore the ocean acidification is included in uh, sustainable development goals. So sustainable development goal 14 states or aims to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. And more specifically, the target 14.3 um, aims to minimize and address the impacts of ocean acidification, including through enhanced scientific cooperation at all levels. So every country is committed to these goals, but then how do we know that um, each country meets their commitment. Well, there's an indicator called indicator 14.3.1, which explains how each country can meet that uh, target and that uh, commitment. And in this um, uh, description, this methodology, it describes what you need to do uh, to go out and collect the data required to monitor ocean acidification. Also gives a little background why we need to do this. Um, what are the accept, uh, accepted um, uh, data, methodologies, uh, and so on. So this is a very interesting document, a very useful document. Uh, so I encourage you um, to uh, download it online and, and, and have a look through it. The reality is that Collecting data for ocean acidification is not easy. It's not something you can just walk out to the coast, dip something in the water and get a number. Collecting carbonate chemistry data or ocean acidification data from the ocean to the quality standard required to um, understand ocean acidification is actually fairly complex and difficult and requires specialist instrumentation and in many cases, trained uh, analysts. So as part of the CME program, we wanted to, um, I guess, give this capability or this capacity to uh, countries and nations that normally don't have this capability to make this high quality uh, carbon chemistry measurements. So we wanted to uh, eliminate the need of having these very expensive, really um, high tech laboratories and the uh, highly trained analysts by providing, well, developing and providing some autonomous uh, equipment where they can be deployed fairly easily without the need of specialist boats um, and then collect data of uh, adequate quality uh, to address uh, the sustainable development goal uh, requirements and the commitment. And also this data can help, uh, I mean, besides uh, addressing the commitment to SDG 14.3. They can also help make informed decisions on how to ma manage the marine environment uh, and also contribute to the global effort uh, of understanding and monitoring for ocean acidification. So we have developed 
the ocean acidification monitoring kit. Uh, the purpose of this system or the requirements was this system was to be easy to use, uh, to be easily deployable, uh, to be as low maintenance as possible, and, has, and to have the least associated maintenance costs with its operation. So we went with a system with a spectrophotometric pH sensor, which offers the highest um, accuracy and precision uh, when it comes to uh, pH measurements in the ocean. Uh, we provided a very high quality uh, CTDO sensor, a commercial off the shelf Seabird uh, microcat, which makes, which makes a high quality temperature salinity and dissolve oxygen uh, measurements. And we also provided uh, battery packs, rechargeable battery packs to avoid um, having to throw away uh, single use batteries uh, and also avoid the costs uh, associated with having to buy new batteries at every deployment. What we also uh, provided is the cap capability to relay the data through satellites. So you could monitor the data as the sensors are deployed. And also you can make them openly accessible to uh, a, a wide uh, number of users or completely open to everyone. Now, how do we, what do we do with the data that come out from the ocean acidification kit? So this is the main um, theme of, of today's, of this session's talk. So what does the sensor do, the pH sensor? So the pH sensor utilizes uh, the spectrophotometric pH assay, which is the accepted uh, high performance method for measuring pH in the ocean. And this method uses an indicator called uh, metacrystal purple. This is a dye, basically a liquid dye, where you can add to the seawater and depending on what color it turns, you can tell exactly what the pH of that seawater is. It's difficult to tell by eye, but if you have uh, a sophisticated uh, optical system, which measures light at two wavelengths or at two colors, let's say, a yellow and a blue, then you can very accurately determine the pH. So this is what the sensor does, basically. So here on the left is a simple schematic of the plumbing or the internal plumbing of the sensor, which is also here on the bottom right in the microfluidic chip. So what happens, we have a pump that has two syringes. That pump will withdraw seawater. Then you will inject that seawater through uh, all the microfluidic chip, and then we'll add a small amount of this um, reagent, this indicator. Now, as it adds that indicator, that indicator will start to diffuse. And after about four to five minutes, it will mix uh, with the seawater sample so that we can make uh, the absorbance measurements and determine the pH. So as that indicator is pushed through the optical cell, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's right here at the bottom of the schematic, then you see a signal that looks like this here on the left. So this signal shows the light intensity from the light source. And as the dye goes in front of it, then the light intensity goes down and then it goes back up. Now this data allows us to calculate absorbance, which is here on the right. And then from this plot, we can take the data that we need, which is about between the blue lines here it's about a few hundreds of uh, data points, and we can calculate pH. Okay. 
So if you see here on the top, so this is the raw data that comes out of the sensor. So if the sensor is measuring continuously, you end up with a series of these uh, curves. So the light is pretty high to start with, then a little die goes through, the light goes down, then it goes back up, then it repeats itself as it makes more measurements. And each color line represents an, an, an optical measurement at the different wavelength or different color. And here at the bottom is just a magnification of two of these measurements. So what do we do with this? Well, we don't do anything with this raw data. The sensor actually calculates pH from this data itself. So at the end of each deployment, what we do is that we go and um, plug in our sensor to the computer. And then we, we click an option on the software that says mount sensor as drive. And when we do that, the computer recognizes our sensor as a USB drive. And then it opens a window with all the files collected by uh, the sensor. So the memory of the sensor is it's quite huge. So we never delete these uh, data files. But we uh, good practice is to take the last file, the deployment file, and then copy, copy it on your computer. So what does the raw data look like? It's basically a um, text file that you can open on, on Excel that has a lot of columns, uh, which to the untrained eye don't make sense. But in summary, you have different channels on top channel zero, one, two, three, four, five. Channel zero and one give an indication of how much light goes through the optical path. So the, the plots I showed earlier where the light goes down and then up again. So these are the two channels, channel zero and channel one. Channel two, channel three uh, can be the temperature measurements that take place inside the optical cell. Then some of these channels are not used for anything. Then the temperature here you can see is the temperature of the actual electronics. So in case there is some issue with a sensor all electronics overheating, you'll see it um, in this column. And then we have the voltage. So this voltage is, is basically tells us what the input voltage is. So if you're running the sensor on a battery, eventually you'll see this voltage going down from 12 volts down to uh, about six volts when the sensor will start shutting down. Now the following columns are basically two sensors that tell us at which position the syringe pump is at. So the first one, it's the position of the pump relative to the bottom. And the other one is the position of the pump relative to the top. So if we have a malfunction we, and we open this file, we will know that the pump is stuck and at each position is stuck. And then the next column is just the timestamp. So we know uh, when everything happens. So this is a useful data file if we want to do some diagnostics if we want to see um, how the sensor is running, uh, what the voltage was when the batteries ran out and so on. But it's not telling us anything about pH or anything else. Now to do that, to get the useful parameters like pH, um, dissolve oxygen temperature and so on, we need to process this uh, raw pH file. Now, raw pH files are quite large. For one or two month deployment, they can be a couple of hundred of megabytes. Uh, so using the, ses the sensor software, you can choose to process the raw pH file. 
And then when you do that, it will ask you to choose a raw pH data file. And then when you find it, you click process, and then it will process and create a new file uh, that has all the processed pH uh, measurements. And if you see here on the left in this small window at the front, there's a lot of parameters there that these parameters are predetermined uh, for each sensor. So they're specific to each sensor and they're basically the calibration parameters. So you should never have to change this unless uh, instructed by us to do so. So this is what the process data looks like. It's much easier to read and makes much more sense. First column is date and time. Second column is the pH value down to three significant uh, figures, uh, which is close to represents the precision of, of our sensor. Then the next column is, is the R value, which is basically the ratio between the two absorbance measurements. And that's how we calculate the pH. But again, you don't need this value. This is more for di diagnostic purposes. Then is the adjusted R value, which is the R value taken into account the calibration parameters. Then is the thermistor temperature. Uh, the thermistor temperature is the temperature inside the optical cell. It's important to know that the measurements we make with the pH sensor, uh, the initial values we get are, is the pH inside the sensor because the, the, the measurement takes place inside then the sensor will uh, take the temperature from the CTD outside in the environment and make a correction. So both temperatures are important. So the thermistor temperature, which is the temperature inside, and then also the temperature that you see here in, in the following column, um, which is the temperature that the CTD measures, which is slightly, always slightly cooler because it's outside. We also have the salinity value here, and then we have the dissolved oxygen um, as well. So, the software will also download, um, well, it also display uh, process data uh, when you first open it. So there is a, there's a window, which is going to show a lot of process data. This is just for visualization uh, purposes. And you could save this file. However, the downside is that there is a, a limit in how many data points this window can hold. So when that limit is reached, the sensor will start overriding these measurements. So if you're doing a long deployment, this uh, window is not really useful. What, I, what uh, I use personally is after a long deployment, I, I have a quick look at it, make sure the sensor worked uh, fine until the end. But the correct data is, um, is the one that you uh, get when you actually process the raw data file. This is just an example data uh, from a, a month long uh, deployment. Uh, in, in Fiji, in this case. So this is basically the process data uh, that I used to make some simple and quick plots on, on Excel. So it doesn't take long at all. So we have the pH at the top, dissolved oxygen below it, uh, the temperature from the CTD and the salinity below. So this is a very quick exercise, but just by doing it so quickly, you can start seeing um, little features. I mean, first of all, you get a feeling of, of, of what the average um, pH is, for example, in that deployment site over a month, you can get a, a good idea of what the range is. Uh, same with dissolved oxygen, temperature, how temperature changes over, over that time. But then you start seeing common features, pH and dissolved oxygen. 
and then the same uh, opposite features features with temperature and salinity. And then from those, then you can start uh, speculating, but also making sense of what is happening in your um, in your system, in your ecosystem, when you're making the measurements. This is another example from uh, from Fiji. This is a short deployment thing. It's five days, but this is just to show you. Uh, how well pH data can agree with dissolved oxygen in some locations. So you, we have uh, dissolved oxygen in blue and pH in red. And you see that the agreement is uh, quite impressive. Uh, also considering that the data comes from two different sensors. So what does this tell me is that whatever happens to the pH, is related to whatever happens to the oxygen concentration. So the first thing that comes to mind, it's biology. So whatever um, produces oxygen, it also uh, raises the pH and whatever uh, drives oxygen down also drives pH down. And then if you plot them against each other, you get a nice correlation. And this ag agrees really well with what you would expect from um, a biological system. When you have photosynthesis, for example, you have a consumption of carbon dioxide in water. The consumption of carbon dioxide it will elevate pH, but also you have a production of oxygen, so that will elevate uh, oxygen concentration as well. Now at night, it's the opposite, pro opposite process. You have respiration. So you have the consumption of oxygen and the production of CO2. So this is basically what, we, what we're seeing here. It's a diurnal cycle. So this is what you should expect in a very biologically driven system. This is another example, the same deployment, but this is uh, temperature and salinity. In this case, the two parameters mirror each other. So you have salinity uh, going up when temperature goes down. So salinity here is in blue, the temperature is in orange. And this, although, you know, take a look at the scales, the scales are actually very small, which shows us how good the sensors are, what small changes they can detect. But also the data overall just shows us that there is uh, an interchange in that particular site between colder and more saline water, which is probably slightly deeper water, with warmer and uh, less saline uh, water. So there's an, there's an interchange. There's water masses coming in and out to that particular site. So the next few slides, I'd like to um, just show why it's important and, and what is the value of collecting high resolution data, and in this case, pH data. So this is a, an example I've, I've used before. Um, to hopefully illustrate the value of this. So this was during a, a short, uh, I don't know, five day, three, uh, five day deployment, yeah, in Sweden, uh, almost a decade ago. But during that time, we went out every day and we collected two, two water samples, we went into the lab, and then we measured pH. And you can see here two uh, measurements per day for that period. So you could easily do that uh, going forward, and then you get a good idea what your average pH will be in that particular location, especially if you do your sampling at different times of day. But that is basically all the information you'll get. You just get some sort of idea of the average um, acidity and how that maybe changes over long periods of time. 
Now, if you had a sensor in there, like we did, then you get a different picture. You start to realize that, you know, pH goes up and then it goes down. It's higher during the day, it's lower at night. Uh, some points that look like outliers uh, in our uh, samples in the before, uh, the sensor shows that they're actually realistic. What is interesting is that if we take the average also of this uh, data set of, of the sensor measurements, we get a very similar mean uh, and standard deviation. So what this tells us is that if we're only interested in knowing what the mean uh, acidity is, perhaps going out there and taking one sample per day or one sample per week for uh, the following years is enough. But if we want to understand what drives these changes in pH, we need to we need these high resolution uh, measurements. So yeah. So if you undersample at a time series, you get an idea of um, uh, average uh, parameters, average values. But uh, an undersampled data series doesn't give you much information on what uh, drives your system. So if you drew a line between those graph samples or those, those um, infrequent measurements, you don't get anything valuable or anything that is, that is true. So basically this is, uh, illustrates why, um, what is the value of this high resolution measurements that we can do with autonomous sensors. That they don't only tell us about, you know, what the average, um, acidity or average values are in our system. They also give us a window into understanding what drives, what the ecosystem, um, how the ecosystem functions and how the ecosystem affects um, these uh, values, in this case, pH. So we collect pH data using this system what do we do with it? So in order to addressing the commitment for uh, SDG 14.3, uh, so the United Nations uh, IOC uh, have this uh, portal, this online portal, where anyone who collects data from every country can uh, go in there, log on and submit their data. So uh, big countries like uh, America and, uh, and the UK and Australia, they have their own uh, data centers and those data centers collect uh, ocean acidification data from everyone who, co who collects the data. So the, the data centers will collect all this data and submit them to this portal. However, in small countries, uh, the individual, person who does the measurements can go uh, on this portal and submit their own data. And to do that is actually fairly simple. I had a, a look uh, at myself. You can go on there and download these templates. So this is a template uh, showing, uh, or the template for submitting the actual data that comes from the sensor. So it's a template like this. Um, it shows, it basically has columns for the name of your station, which you can name whatever you want. You can put the coordinates of the location, date and time of each measurement, uh, the depth. In this case, this uh, template is for an instrument called the ISAMI PH but you can put the name of the instrument you use. And then there is a column for flags. So there's a, a standard um, protocol for assigning uh, flags to data. And the flags, a flag can be indicating that the data might be uh, um, 
bad, so the measurement was impacted by something, or it might indicate that um, uh, the data is outside a certain quality range and so on. But you can, um, there is, from this website, there's a link to um, the protocol with all the lists uh, of all the flags. So you can use that, um, that table to, um, to fill this in. And then there's temperature option. Uh, in our case, you can add another column with dissolved oxygen and so on. So fairly simple, you fill up the form, uh, a lot of copying and pasting from the processed output of, uh, of our sensor. And of course, with every data set you um, submit, you have to submit uh, metadata. So metadata is just a collection of information that helps people understand how you did the measurements, where you did the measurements, who did the measurements, how they can get in touch with you, uh, what instrument you use, when that instrument was calibrated, uh, what method was used, so all the information. So if, if somebody wants to do some research using that data, then they have the metadata to give them an indication of perhaps how comparable this data set is to another data set, how good your data is, and, and so on. So that's very important. So uh, the Global Ocean Certification Observing Network has uh, made some um, webinars, which are now on YouTube, that describe this process of submitting data. And they're actually um, very clear uh, and very useful. So I um, encourage you to go and, and watch this if you haven't done so already. And finally, we talked about telemetry. We talked about the capability of our sensor equipment to um, relay data through satellites. And this allows us to display the data online. So this is the primary um, use of this facility is to make the data access accessible to more uh, people. And through a program called, uh, or a website called ThingSpeak, this is a free website, you can display this data. You can um, have the data uh, relate to this website, and then you can choose how your data uh, is visualized. So in this case, in this window, you see we have pH, water temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen. So you can have this openly available so anyone from all over the world can go on this website and, and see what you know temperature or pH is at any certain time in Dominica or Fiji or Belize or you can um, restrict it between colleagues or agencies uh, as as you wish but the the ambition is to make this data uh, openly available to everyone. And that's all I have for uh, the data talk. Do you have any questions, any comments? Is anyone there? Are you all going to sleep? Um, no, I, I don't have any questions. Um, I thought the presentation was very clear. Um, even though we have the ISAMI, um, some of what you said was relevant to you know our use of the ISAMI and just bought. I'm not a. I'm not a oceanographer or ocean chemist. So it, um, some of the things that you said brought clarity to what I already know. So I really don't have any <laughs> questions. <laughs> Just, well, um, 
thank you for the presentation. Maybe maybe I, maybe I have a, a question for you. How how do you use the ISAM? In what in what way do you use it? Well, we have just just started to use it. Um, we just put it out um, late last year to test it out, and then we put it back in November. Um, so we have we're we haven't taken it up since then, the end of November. Um, but it's really we are collecting water samples um, in a number of locations in where we are, but we haven't been able to analyze them. I think the COVID pandemic yeah. has disrupted our monitoring program, but what we are doing is that we collect month, our plan is that we would collect monthly water samples to measure pH using a spectrophotometer mm -hmm. and um, use measuring alkalinity using the electrode. Um, to measure alkalinity and then we that so that would give us like a monthly you know um idea of the ph and um, alkalinity but we are we are hoping that the the isami will give us like the diurnal exactly. change and, and changes over the variation over time and we are hoping we have collected the samples, but haven't been able to analyze them to check whether what we are getting with the water samples is the same readings that we're getting with the yeah. ice summit, so to kind of validate the ice summit. So all of it is in a, you know the beginning stages, yeah. but because That's of great. the COVID and movement restrictions and so on, yeah. we haven't been able to sort of go go at it full force. I mean, that, that's one of the main advantages of the ocean acidification kit in a box that the Ocean Foundation is, is giving out, is that you have the capacity to go out and take samples and measure them in the lab. Um, but you also have the ISANI that you can deploy for a few days that will give you this high resolution idea of what the uh, variability is. So it's a nice combination. Also, you can measure total alkalinity, which uh, together with pH, it can help you calculate the whole carbonate system, which is also very powerful. Um, I think that the only challenge with the ISAMI, as you had indicated, is that it has to be in very shallow water. Yeah. So we're not really able to deploy it on the fore reef. Um, we have it in the back reef now in 2.5 meters of water. Yeah, and when it's shallow, it's, it's very exposed, isn't it, to waves and... Well, it's in, it's in the back reef, so it's a little protected. Okay. Uh, so there's a, the reef crest, and then it's behind the reef crest. So there is some amount of protection mm -hmm. um, from waves. That's great. That's good. Good to hear. Thank you. Any other comments? Has anyone, does anyone have any experience with uh, submitting data to for uh, SDG 14.3? No, okay. Okay, if nobody else has any questions or comments, shall we um, move on? <laughs>